Hello and a warm welcome back to the latest in our series of Ireland's Olympians, looking and talking with the people that are going to be part of Team Ireland, either on the pitch, on, in the pool, on the track, or behind the scenes, making sure that everything happens. I'm really delighted to be joined this morning by Patricia Hebole. She is the chef de mission of the Irish Olympic team, heading out to Tokyo. She will be 12 months from now. You're a very warm welcome to you, Tricia. Thank you, Rob. It's, uh, it's great to actually be able to talk to you. Well, you above anybody else are somebody that I've really felt for over the course of this time because the athletes, they kind of know what they have to do and they can press pause and they can pick up their program and they can pick up their preparation. You are in charge. Your very job description is to make sure that everything happens. And a global pandemic, which has led to the postponement of the Olympics, was probably not on your agenda when you uh, came over to Ireland first. And even in January, when you were putting the final touches to the, uh, to the 2020 plan. Oh, look, absolutely. I mean, one of the key parts of our work is uh, re uh, managing risk and, and scenario planning. And there are many things on, on the list in our risk management audit leading into the Olympics and at the Olympics, but the one thing we didn't have on the list was something like COVID-19. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big job that I have, um, but there are a couple of things that are really important that help. I've been able to recruit and build a great team around me. Um, we have a lot of expertise, a lot of experience but also some different personalities and, and people at different times in their career working with Team Ireland. And the other thing that's helped me a lot, of course, is the organisation. Um, the progress of the organisation in the last couple of years has been absolutely amazing. And so as Chef to Mission, you need both of those things. You need the support of the board and your organisation. And I'm fortunate that I work well with, I believe, Sarah Keane and Peter Sherrard. And then you need to understand that, yes, you have the responsibility. You may be the key leader, the key manager, uh, but without your support staff and without that engagement with, with the leaders in sport, you, you actually are nothing. There are so many strings and so many pieces of the puzzle to actually put into place. We've been together when teams of uh, delegations from, from Fukuroi and from Japan mm -hmm. have come over en masse uh, for the signing of documents, which lead to the fact of you're bringing the team to arrive on a particular day at a particular hour to have particular food laid out and everything else. How difficult is it going to be to replicate everything that was going to be there in, as we sit at the moment through to 12 months hence? And that level of uncertainty, not only about whether the games will go ahead, but how the games will go ahead. How are you planning for this incredible level of change which is which is evident all over the place look i think um one of our biggest challenges is obviously the logistics um so when you were looking at building your team and, and moving people into um you know the environment which is tokyo and japan but not just one environment we we had sports um with training camps in regional areas and we also have sports that will be remote to tokyo our cycling for example out near Mount Fuji, um, sailing down on the coast to Inoshima. The good thing is that you, you start your planning um, a long way out, and we were well advanced in planning in 2018. And as you say, in January, we would have been starting to put some of the final touches on everything we were doing, and we were really just waiting for people to qualify so we knew what the totality of the team would be. In the period of time um, since the postponement, you, you have to get together very quickly, all the right people in the room, and establish what things you can control and what things sit within your jurisdiction that you may need to either re-engage with your partners in Japan or have conversations with sport or airlines, with sponsors, all those things. And then which bits and pieces you are relying on getting information from someone else and whether that's the Tokyo Organising Committee or in, in most cases, it's the IOC. And what we've tried to do is focus our attention on the things that sit with the OFI. What, what we can control, what we need to do. And I'm actually very happy that we've been able to re-sign um, the Memorandum of Understanding with Fukuroi for the pre-games camp. That's a big part of the jigsaw puzzle for us. 
Uh, we're currently negotiating with three other regional centres um, in respect of the, the boxing pre-games camp, the track cycling teams pre-games camp and, and hockey. And so those local partnerships are very important uh, because besides the fact that they provide a unique Japanese environment and, and um, preparatory period for our athletes, some of those partnerships also offset some of the costs that would have normally been picked up by the OFI if we wanted to be able to prepare in the best possible way. But um, it really is a bit of a balancing act. Um, most of the things that we were able to look after, you know, in respect of um, locking in sponsors, um, working with the airlines around changing tickets, working with accommodation in Japan and, and with the organising committee, we've been able to tick off on those things. We're probably now waiting for the next phase, which will be a consequence of last week, um, TOCOG being able to announce uh, that they've redone the competition schedules and um, that particular aspect of work obviously has a knock on to our, our sports. Um, but that was a very important piece of work that we're now responding to and going back and working with our sports. What has been the sense of, of dealing with the officials in Japan? Because we've, we've become very insular as part of COVID in, in, in national terms. So we look at what's happening in Ireland we feel, we hope we've got a, a good control over it. But then we look to the outside world and we see that, you know, this is a virus which is, uh, which is still rampant. And there are, there are different attitudes to it in different places around the world as well. Japan has to face the, the prospect of welcoming all of those different attitudes and all of those different athletes into their country. How are they feeling about that? Look, I think, like for everyone, it, it's been a challenge for the Japanese and probably initially we were so fixated on our own situation and what we had to do um, that we didn't really have a sense of what they were going through at the time. And I think there were two things. The grieving over not being able to host the Olympics with everything so close, with all of their planning so advanced, um, I think would have been extremely difficult. But just like us, they were in their own lockdown and so our ability to have some of the conversations with our partners and even to progress some of the work that we wanted to be able to do, there was a period of two months or so where in fact we couldn't do that because the reality was that as you said, uh, they, they were having to deal with their highest priority, which was you know, controlling, controlling the virus. Um, but the, the one thing that has been incredibly impressive about the Japanese is their generosity and they are extremely proud um, to be able to host the games. And while I know there are still challenges um, ahead of them, uh, they've reopened for business. We have regular contact with TOCOG and we're looking forward to what would be the next Chef to Mission conference in, in October where the 206 chefs from all over the world come and engage with the IOC and TOCOG around some of the next steps. Might you be hopeful that that would take place in person or has that already been signed off as being a, a, a virtual session? Look, I think um, for practicality's sake, it's, it's going to be a virtual session. If you can imagine bringing all the continents together and even the language challenges with some of them. Um, I would love to get back to Japan. And uh, certainly we've been told that January to March, they will start rehosting visits and we had to cancel one of our visits this year, so we will very much be taking up that opportunity if it's safe to travel um, and things are going well. But no, look, everything is remote at the moment. Um, the main thing is, as I said, we, we need the updates on a constant basis from both the IOC and from the TOCOG. Um, if we are armed with the most up-to-date information, then in turn we pass it on to our sports, we, we pass it on to the people in charge of those, those sports, and we we take away as much of the uncertainty as, as we can. Okay. Um, viewers might be able to guess, but you're Australian by, uh, by, by birth, by nature, by Olympic representation. How has it been for you? Because you've been locked down here with us here in Ireland all of this time. I'm sure you've still got family back in Australia. How have you found it being so removed and remote in terms of your own personal life outside of everything to do with the Olympics? It's an interesting one, Rob, because typically um, if the Olympics had gone ahead and even some of the things that we had in the calendar between March and um, July when we would have, would have gone to Tokyo, I, I wouldn't have seen my family. And I haven't been home since November 2018, but we do stay well connected. 
thank goodness we have a lot of different platforms, um, you know, from, from FaceTime and WhatsApp and, and something called Zoom. Um, and that does allow me to stay close to my family. But I think, like anyone else, when you're in this sort of situation, um, you are interested in how they're going. You're interested whether there are any concerns. Um, and Australia is a big country. Um, I'm lucky my family predominantly come from West Australia, which was relatively untouched by the virus. Uh, they closed the state borders very early. They, they closed down international travel in the airports. And they probably responded as, as well as, as anyone could. Uh, there are some real challenges on the east coast um, of Australia right now, but I'm lucky that I can touch base with my family um, and have, have the sort of conversations where I'm, I'm still able to remember people's birthdays and uh, good old Auntie Tricia sitting in uh, the Northern Hemisphere can say hello to the nieces and nephews. Great. Well, listen, I hope that it's not too long before you actually get back to see them in person. and. You know, I'd love to see your to-do list in whatever form you keep it, because it's going to be some operation that you're trying to keep on top of and keep balanced over the next 12 months. Uh, no better person. We're delighted to have you. And it's been great to have you on Sport for Business today as well. So, Tricia Hebele, our chef de mission for Team Ireland, thank you very much. Thank you very much.